Uh, it's really lovely to be here and I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, Poets and Players have invited me to read uh, um, um, and to be out uh, amongst each other for a wonderful crowd as well, which is just terrific. Um, this, these two books came out um, in the midst of the pandemic. One, I think, was in hand just as we were going in and the second one sort of right in the middle of things. So, so I've been fortunate now and I gave a reading from the last week in public and I'm sort of giving my second reading now. So they feel a bit uh, belated in their arrival, but it's also lovely at the same time to hold them again and think about them. I didn't have any copies of coffee at all. I had to write the publisher. I haven't thought about it in about a year. God, remarkable. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, uh, I'll read a couple of translations from the Greek of Kabafi. I won't read the Greek, I'm not a native speaker, I'm just going to upset everybody. Um, but if you don't know Kabafi, he was a queer Alexandrian poet, uh, um, um, writing away by himself, with kind of no support, but no interest in having any support either, um, who among others, Ian Forrester brought to the attention of T.S. Eliot, and something became more and more famous, and he, he, he didn't publish a book in his lifetime, even kind of remarkably, he just sort of let things kind of uh, go as they would. Um, and I'll read you a couple uh, um, of shorter poems. Um, they don't need too much introduction, I don't think. Or maybe this one doesn't anyways. Um, this is called The 25th Year of His Life. He returns regularly to the bar where they met a month ago. He asks around, but no one tells him anything, only rumors. He found someone completely rootless. One of the many complicated, misunderstood young men who come and go. He returns regularly to the bar every evening and sits opposite the entrance. He sits there all night. Maybe he will be here. Be here. Three weeks pass like this. His mind feverish with longing, kisses fresh on his lips. His entire body suffers from an endless yearning the warmth of that other body against his own. He wants to feel that again. He does not give his intention away, but is at the same time careless. He knows the risk, a conscious decision. It is not unlikely this life of his will lead to a dangerous scandal. In this poem, so Kabaki wrote a number of modes um, the last one was erotic, which I realize by our standards isn't particularly erotic. Um, and this is in his historical mode. Um, it's a poem about the uh, Byzantine historian uh, Anna von Nenen. Um, she wrote a book called The Alexia, a uh, story of her, a history of her father, who was emperor. Anna von Nenen. In the prologue to her Alexia, Anna von Nenen laments her widowhood. She's overwhelmed. And my eyes are drowning, she tells us, in a flood of tears. Fierce are the ways of life, long the revolutions. Grief burns her to the bones, marrow, the very center of the heart. But likely, there was just one serious regret this woman of ambition had, though she does not admit it. Even with all her scheming, this highborn Greek failed to win the throne. The insolent John took it right out of her hands. I'm going to follow that um, with some poems from my book, Later Emperors. Um, so Later Emperors is kind of four long poems, so it's kind of difficult to kind of dip in and out of. So I'm going to give you a kind of sample of one of the longer poems. Um, this section concerns another Byzantine historian, um, a guy called Michael Psellos, who you won't have heard of, but who in fact is very important. Um, to us now because he was one of the thinkers in Byzantium um, who went back to Plato, who applied kind of Platonic ideals and Aristotelian ideals to the Bible and sort of helped kickstart the Renaissance, really, more than anything. Um, he died very mysteriously. Uh, um, he, just, he, he, he had a book unfinished. Um, and so my poems, uh, I'm trying to imagine what might happen to him afterwards. Um, it's called The Further Adventures of Michael Psellus. Many days yet. As a child, Michael Sellers once fell off his horse, boarded a kite, and somewhere downstream slipped overboard. His parents picked him up. He never had much luck with girls, but the ones he loved loved him back. Between the hills and the ocean, he made his way to adulthood and into the retinue of emperors. A motion of the hand and a nod of the head brought him forward. He seems to just know things, the emperors thought, pausing at things. One morning, though, 
Michael woke up exiled and alone, his eyes still in his head. This was a Byzantine worry. It was only the beginning of his, sorry, it was only the middle of his long, late life, and not the end. There were many days yet left for him to exist. The book dwindles. Michael sits on his terrace with Apollodorus of Damascus. He has read him so much that the book dwindles, learning more about warfare than intended. Wall fighting, the position of infantry, cavalry skirmishes. It is early spring, the rain is obvious. Right, he thinks, coming back to his work, the book between his fingers and thumb, the feel of it. Take this to the emperor, so that it all rushes forward at last, so that someone like himself may question the role of such a man as himself. The emperor dislikes questions. He is in love with his throne, and only Michael is his friend. One of the fountains. A storm at sea, thunder over the palace, the emperor is gone. Another stands to take his place. Men support or move against him. Michael listens to both arguments, but is remembering the church of St. George the Martyr. The emperor had the original demolished, ordered architects to plan a loftier basilica high in the city. Gardens hanging, columns on tops of columns. Lawns ornamented with flowers and fountains around the base of one, the bottom relief of seasons passing. It was, following the long side of construction, so very moving a place. The emperor toured his achievement, but had already lost interest. All was well and already in the past. The infinite is a mushroom. Gradually, the stubborn empress died. She was 20 years older, and the emperor was seized by a brokenheartedness. He went to his advisors and, mourning, he said, tomb, he said, miracle, he said. Some consoled him. When he said infinite, Michael understood the words were as stubborn as the empress. He thought of Anaxagoras. My mourning is in everything, in everything. The tomb is a beehive. The miracle is the royal blood. The infinite is a mushroom referred to a peach. But we offer in our losses pushes against mortality and can feel something pushing back. The emperor liked this. When his sister died, he barely noticed. Ordered arrows shot. The empress was in her room. The emperor upstairs had been with his mistress. All agreed this was a bad idea. A formal oath praised by the senators, was administered, and the distress of this way and that, until Michael, knowing all of this will end, even if the wind doesn't blow, elevated the tone of the words. Little wonder that Trojans and Achaeans suffer for such a woman. Well, thought Michael, the senators agreed, consoling the inconsolable. And out he went, thinking things all right, all the signs of acceptance pointing his way. He retreated home, sat down to dinner, holding on to what he had, what he was. The emperor ordered arrows shot at those who disagreed. A field of pear trees. Those men, the emperor ordered, and those men. The soldiers left 15,000, led to 15,000 towards his grace, knowing, held in the setting sunlight, their swords sharpness. Take the Bulgars' sight, the emperor ordered. It was impossible, but the soldiers did it. Then the Bulgars could see only red through the smashed windows of their faces. Opposite, there was a field of pear trees where survivors found their way to food the Romans didn't want. Then hounds began to howl, the music of God among the trees, the odor of, the odor of fruit and fighting. It's not true, Michael tells himself, a myth of the historians. He knows the excellent of the excellence of the court historians their fixed and balanced writing. After something else. All the worries to dust, yes, like the Alex, like the library of Alexandria, the Serapium. But we hold on to them as ideals, argued Michael, the glories lost, the statues fallen. The emperor stopped him. He paced the royal chamber nightly, 
the empire buried under the body of its enemies, Antioch, Mensikert, places that were clues to his ambition hidden on the map, his mind and his matter was inflexible. Michael admired this. The helmsman guides the ship, the soldier bears arm, the emperor places trust in God, he continued. All cities to rock and sand. I know this, shouted the emperor, now tell me how to hold it all. Michael held his finger to his lips after something else. The city was burning. The emperor died mysteriously in his bath. The emperor was captured and killed at Manzikert. The emperor was alive, held to ransom. The emperor was no more. His brother plotted a coup. People rioted. His son came of age. The empress took a younger lover. The city was burning, the plague all consuming. The houses and churches emptied, filled, emptied. The emperor understood and said so much, his voice growing fainter as the Varangian guard led him away. Not yet negligible. His voice growing fainter as the soldiers led him away. He must be alive somewhere, heeding an emperor's worries, warm in front of a fire. He is not yet negligible. He will read this and know he has taken enough blame. I thought I'd close with um, a little note Gavafi wrote. Um, so these were these are published. There are other translations of them. But you know, <laughs> um, uh, Gavafi uh, mostly wrote poetry. He's, he's only really renowned for poetry. But there were bits and pieces of prose that he did write. Among them sort of, what is it, uh, 27 little notes on poetics that he uh, had sort of left in a pile in his room. Um, someone did collect these, and so this is my translation of one of them, which uh, might hit home a little bit. What a horrible thing, the new philosophical ideas of hardness, of might's superiority over right, the supposed purging of the struggle of the eradication of the meek and the sick, etc., etc. Since we must live in a society, since civilization stems from this, since by this means we succeeded in and resisted the difficult life circumstances that first besieged humankind, what do these insane hardnesses and superiorities, etc., have to say? If we carried them out, we would see they would bring us to annihilation. One of the strong, whether directly or indirectly, will destroy ten of the weak here, there, another, and another ten of the weak, and so on. Strength will not save them. Of these, some will be less strong. These, as the initial wave of weak men are forgotten or wiped out, will be the weak. They must be destroyed ten at a time, or five at a time, or two at a time, until only the powerful are left, but a few equals. Then how will they live? Not hardness, but clemency, grief, compromise, kindness. These, of course, widely, nothing in excess are also power and wisdom. Thank you for your time.